energy and with attitude and great to be here this Monday morning had a great uh, had a great weekend and so I'm hoping that uh, you had a great weekend also with a sunny weather I think it was sunny here wasn't it it was sunny yesterday but I think did it rain I can't even remember I was oh. working so hard on Saturday oh I was swimming <laughs> in the Marlborough Sound so it was all good with me for me <laughs> <laughs> well today guys we have a uh, a guest speaker as we usually do and Donna Watt uh, from Gibson and Cheetah is here today uh, talking about dying without a well and that's something that is really important that's about getting a well because Donna, what happens when a person dies without a well? First introduce yourself and then we'll get sure. into the conversation. Okay, well hello, I'm Donna, I'm Donna Watt and I work at Gibson Sheet as a lawyer and one of the things that I'm really passionate about is that everyone should have a well and so that's why it's so good that you've invited me here to talk about what happens if you actually die without a will mm. and, and the consequences of that. And I guess to summarise, for most people, not for all, but for most people, what it means is that you lose the ability to actually choose who you want to administer your affairs if you die mm. and, and you actually end up putting quite a bit of stress on your family because you leave them with probably a more expensive estate to administer and it's going to cost more to administer. And then there's also stress because you haven't told them what you want to have happen. And so sometimes that can lead to, to fighting between families or it can lead to um, uncertainty. Costing more money? I didn't realise that it would cost more if I didn't have a will. Yeah, yeah. You know, I just thought, oh yeah, if I die... They'll just sort it out and that's it. So tell me about some of the legal stuff that happens. As you said, there's, I don't get the chance to choose or someone else chooses for me. What's the legal ramifications on all of that kind of stuff? Sure. So if you write a will, one of the important things that you do in that will is you, you choose someone called an executor or people called executors and trustees and they're the people that set out what happens to you or they, they actually administer your estate yep. and so they make sure that your funeral's paid for if you want one, they make sure that you're cremated or buried, whatever you want to have happen and then they call in your debts and then they follow your will. But if you haven't appointed people like that, then the court actually has to appoint someone to act as your administrator. And so that's going to start costing because you have to apply for something called letters of administration. Okay. Can I just go back a step, um, Donna? So, and this is because I'm trying to get it in my mind. Sure. Know. So, like, if I die mm -hmm. and there is no one um, who's going to act on my behalf in terms of an executor, right? Yes. So, do, does that mean that I have to stay in the mortgage longer because there's, who's going to pay Who's going to take care of that? Or, do I, or does that come afterwards? You know it, what I'm saying? It doesn't mean you'll stay in the morgue longer. Okay. And it, does mean, it doesn't mean anything to do with what's going to happen initially with your funeral. Yep. But it does mean that there's probably going to be some family confusion over what's going to happen and how that funeral might be paid for. Okay. Okay. So, again, I'm putting more stress on my family because you've got the funeral. That's stressful if someone's dying. And then after that, when it should be, okay, everything's, you just grieve. Now I've got to deal with all the fighting. That might happen. It might be more confusing and there might be stress on your family. At least if you've appointed an executor, that person's in control mm. and that person is, is the person who ultimately can make those decisions about how that's going to happen. Okay, so you took something about a letter of authority? A letter, letters of administration. administration. So let's just say if you did die without a will yep. and you had assets that needed to be administered, mm -hmm. then that's when letters of administration comes in. Because let's just say you had some money in the bank. Let's just say you had um, over $15,000 in the bank. Okay. And say your family thought, right, well, we need to go and close that bank account down and we need to go and we need to get that money and we'll divvy it up in the f between the family. Okay. So someone from your family might go to the bank and they might say, well, look, um, Tony's died mm. and we need to sort things out. Okay. We need to close down his account and the bank will say, thank you for letting us know that he's died. We'll freeze his account. Yep. But you can't actually access that money until you've either got probate of his will 
or letters of administration. So that's when things get tricky, because if there's a will, that makes things much simpler. Yep. But if you have to get letters of administration, that's a longer process, costs more, and it involves um, a range of different things. So let's just say that, let's just say you didn't have a will. Yep. So your family then would need to firstly, or to find out, was there a will anywhere? Oh, okay. So they're going to do a search. Mm. All right. So they're going to search through all your papers. But they're also going to have to search around all the lawyers um, and the law firms in the areas that you've lived in. Okay. They're going that's to have to. Time. Yeah, that's right. It could take a long time. Um, they're going to have to advertise to make sure that no one else knows, probably in New Zealand, basically, that, that you, you didn't have a will. So they'll do that through a lawyer's magazine, basically. So again, long time and also costs more. And, and then finally there'll be an application to the court called Letters of Administration and that's going to cost more again for your family to actually put that in place because that would normally involve um, more time from lawyers and also more court time. I, I guess because the court likes to see evidence that you've got to evidence those steps. They need to see evidence of those steps, so you would, um, someone in your family would need to be chosen to administer your estate, and then they would have to sign an affidavit or an affirmation to say, this is what we've done, and this is what we've looked for, and they'd have to attach copies of documents to show what they'd done. Oh, wow. In terms of choosing someone, that could be difficult just in itself because with family dynamics, no, uh, you can't do this, you're used to that, that, blah, blah, blah. It could be difficult. And so that's another thing that's that's tricky. So let's just say you have, oh, how many children do you have? I have five. Okay. Well, let's just say that that one of your five children decided that they were the best person to be your administrator. Mm -hmm. But the problem is that they then need to get consent from your other four children <laughs> that they are the best person to be the administrator. Yep. And that's assuming that you don't also have a partner or a, or a wife All right. who would also probably be the first person that would be chosen to be the administrator of your estate. Okay. So that gets really tricky. So they have, there has to be uh, a consent by everyone. There has to be consent, that's right, that a certain person is chosen to administer your estate. Whereas if you've just got that in your will, that's what you've said you want to have happen, and that's the person that's chosen to administer your estate. And it's pretty straightforward then, because that person is there on your behalf, blah. Yeah, a lot, definitely a lot more oh straightforward. My goodness. And it solves all of that confusion or um, possibly infighting in your family, which yeah. is the last thing that you want. Because the reality is that it's a will is, is not even so much for you. It's more for your family. It's for the people that you leave behind. Because it won't worry you. No, you're gone. That's exactly right. But it yeah. will worry the people that you leave behind. And so you'll be wanting a will to provide certainty as to who you choose to yeah. administer your estate. So you don't have to go through that whole process mm. of applying for letters of administration mm. just to choose the administrator. Mm. So really it's about forward planning on your, your part. It surely is. And to help your family uh, go through the grieving process with as less stress as possible. Absolutely. Mm. And, and so, you know, that's one of the things that, yeah. that you want to be able to choose someone who's going to be the administrator. And you put that person, um, that person is normally called the executor mm -hmm. in your will. And so you nominate that person or two people. If you choose more than one person at one t together, they have to act unanimously. Okay. And so, you know, you could say, well, I know that, that this person and, um, you know, this, my daughter or my son, um, they're going to work well together and they're going to be good administrators so okay. that's the first thing that you can put those people in place and mm. you know that they'll be there for um, doing that kind of work you know they don't have any creativity it's not as if they if you've got a will it's not as if they can say oh well we're going to change this we're going to, to distribute this to this person and this to put this person and this person's been missed out of the will it doesn't work like that you know they follow your will as if it's a bible okay so donna in terms we spoke before about or you gave a hypothetical scenario that I had 15000 in the bank, mm -hmm. right? Is there uh, a lower limit? So, like, for instance, if I had a, a million-dollar estate, okay, I would expect that someone will have to divide all that up, you know? 
But what if I only had a thousand dollars? Do we still have to go through that process? So there are times when you're right that potentially a will isn't so important. So one of the times might be if you have only you know maybe a thousand dollars with this bank and a thousand dollars with that bank, and so there's no bank that's going to say you need either probate of your will or some kind of letters of administration mm. for us to administer it. But there might be other reasons that you want a will. So probably the most important reason that I would say someone should have a will is if you have children under the age of 18 years. Okay. Because then in your will you can appoint a testamentary guardian. Okay. And I think it's really important that you should be able to choose who you would want to make all those important decisions about your children. Mm -hmm. if you were to die. So even if, if you've got a partner and you have children together, you've still got to think about you know, the, the worst case scenario, and that is that, that something takes you out both together at the same time. And so who would you want to choose to make all those really important decisions about your children? Mm -hmm. So you're appointing that guardian. The guardian doesn't have to have your children living with them, but they make the decisions about who the children should be living with and, and all the other important decisions. Okay. Even if you've separated from the father of your child or the, the mother of your child and you still want to, to have someone who would have the say in your will, you can still put that person in as a testamentary guardian in your will. Okay, all right. If I have a... If I have a partner... Mm -hmm. How how does how do you split the estate up? Mm -hmm. okay, so really good question. Like I got say five children, my partner. Yeah. How yeah. how does it get split up if I don't have a will? Okay, so if you don't have a will and you have a partner, mm -hmm. and let's just say you do have five children, because that's a really good example. Because normally what we'd think is, well, of course, you know, I've got a partner. If I die without a will everything's going to go to my partner. Mm. You'd think that that would just be quite logical. But what actually happens is that a piece of legislation called the Administration Act kicks in. Okay. And so, first of all, as we were talking before, you have to apply for someone to administer your estate. Yep. Okay, that's fine. So you've done that. But the law has some specific legislate or there's some specific steps as to who receives what if you die without a will. So let's just say you had more than $155,000 that was your money yep. um, in a bank account. Um, let's just say you had some shares. Mm -hmm. Let's say that you owned a house with your partner, but you owned it as tenants in common and equal shares. So you actually owned half in your name. Okay. Yep. And, and so you actually had quite a bit of asset in your name. And you might have thought, well, everything's going to go to my partner. So that's fine. Yep. But actually, what the law says is that your partner gets your personal chattels. Okay. Okay? Yep. The first $155,000 of your, of your assets goes to your partner, but then the rest gets divided, and your partner gets a third, and your children get two-thirds. Okay. So that may not be what you want. Mm. You actually might not be expecting that your five children are going to be receiving quite a significant sum of money. It might mean that your partner's actually going to have problems continuing to live in the house. Because mm. mm. yeah, <clears throat> yeah. we need money to actually keep your house maintained too, don't we? Exactly. Yeah. So that mm. might not be what you'd expected when you thought, oh, well, you know, that's fine. It, it's, everything's going to go to my partner. So... You know, in some instances, it's not a problem because maybe you don't have $155,000 worth of assets. Mm. The other reason why it might not be such a problem is that you might actually own everything jointly or mainly jointly with your partner. Mm. So sometimes people own houses jointly. Yeah. And what that means is that you would look on the title of your property. So you need to check the title of your property. And if you own it on, there's on one line on the title of your property and it says that you own it with your partner together, then if you die, that property goes completely to the other person okay. by survivorship. So that's one thing. Same for joint bank accounts. 
Okay. So joint bank accounts, if you own it with another person jointly, it will just go straight to that other person by survivorship. Yep. So I guess, I guess the answer to my question, to your question, is that sometimes it can be really problematic if you own, if you have that family situation with a partner and five children. Other times, if you own everything jointly with your partner, then it may not be a problem at all. Mm. It's to do with what you own in your own name. Okay, yeah. As yeah. you said, the survivor, if you own things jointly, the survivor takes control over everything. Exactly. Yeah. But I'll, I'll tell you another scenario where it might be a problem. So let's just say that you have a blended family. Okay. And let's just say that you die without a will. Mm -hmm. And let's say you own everything jointly with your new partner. So everything is going to go to the new partner. To the new partner. Yeah. Okay. And you will have nothing left the children. for your children. Nothing at all. And that might not be what you want too. And I guess that's what I was, was meaning when I said that you lose control. You lose control of trying to work out well, how are things going to be divvied out the way I want them to be divvied out. Yeah, yeah. And, and it also explains why it can be really stressful when it comes to dying without a will. Because there are some pieces of legislation that can kick in. Um, they can kick in, in fact, whether you've got a will or not. But I'm just thinking about um, if you were to, if you, if you died and you'd, you had five children from a previous relationship and you'd left everything to your, um, your new partner because you'd hold, held all your assets jointly. Mm then that becomes really stressful because your five children need to decide, are they going to make a claim under the Family Protection Act? Um, they're going to have to make a claim under two pieces of legislation, actually. They're going to have to pull money out of um, using the Property Relationships Act, and then they're going to have to make a claim under the Family Protection Act. Because that piece of legislation says that we've all got a moral obligation to provide adequate support for certain people, and your highest moral obligation is to your partner or spouse, but your second highest moral obligation is to your children. Okay. I, I want to ask a, a question about the children business. Mm -hmm. So if I am 90, mm -hmm. I'm 90, so is my 70-year-old son still considered children under that act under that family protection act yeah, yeah. he absolutely is oh. yeah so sometimes you see this piece of legislation it's in the news it, it pops up but it, they don't necessarily name it so we see a situation where we've got um yeah, let's say 70 year old son has been estranged from dad or dad yeah let's say dad let's say from you yeah, yeah, yeah. for the last 20 years and it might have been his fault but we, we, won't, we won't even go into that. He's yeah. just been estranged. Yep. There's a reason for it. And you die, leaving millions. So let's just say that um, you did have a will in this situation, because it doesn't really matter whether you have a will or not. But um, son comes back into the fold thinking, well, yeah, that's right. Um, dad's died, and, and where's my money? Yeah. And so if you don't have a will, he's considered one of your children under the legislation, and he actually receives equally, he receives an equal share with your other children. Of their two thirds? Of, um, well, let's assume you didn't have a partner. Okay. So he, it would be, your um, estate would be divided equally yep. between all of your children. So this is possibly another reason then why um, it's you might not want him to receive an equal share. Another reason to have a will, because in your will, you might have actually decided, well, I'm not going to leave him out because I know he could make a claim under the Family Protection Act. Mm. But the Family Protection Act doesn't say that he's got a right to an equal share of your estate. Okay. It just says that you need to provide him with adequate support. So he could come back in and he could, you, you might have left him a small amount in your will not as much as your other children, mm -hmm. but it was still adequate support. 
I get, yeah, I've got a little bit, uh, it's all become a bit confusing here to, to do with whether or not you've got a will or whether, whether or not you haven't. But I guess the main thing is that we quite often see in the news that a son will come or a daughter or someone will come, they've been estranged for a long time, they'll make a claim and we'll think, how can they possibly have made a claim on that person's estate? Because they haven't seen that person for 20 years, yeah. but actually they've made a claim under that piece of legislation, which says that we've, all of us, as will makers, have a moral obligation to provide adequate support to yeah. our children, not necessarily equal support, but adequate. Adequate support. Yeah, because yeah. I'm also thinking about the blended family um, business because, mm. as you said, if it's joint, and well, then my children, previous children, get nothing. That's right. If you, that's right, that's exactly right. It becomes really tricky. And the more complicated your family is, the more reason there is to get a will yeah. because you want to make sure that that you at least know all of those reasons that that potentially life could could um, implode following your death yeah. and try and avoid them and you can do that there are ways that you can make sure that your property is is divided or is is um, divided only after the death maybe of your new partner so that that everyone is, oh, okay. is provided for. All right. So, but and if you, you don't have a will, yeah. if you don't have a will, you lose the ability to actually make that happen and it just can become so much more complicated. Oh, my head's all going all yeah, yeah. haywire, not because of, it's because of the work that has to be done. If I don't have a will, mm. you have to go and write, oh, write to the lawyers or seek out the lawyers to see if there was a will there yes. being held. That's going to take a while. And then you have to go and have a family hui. Mm -hmm. It could take a long time because there could be some, no, you're not good enough to, to look after this. You can't do this. You can't do this. Exactly. So you can get that consensus. Yes. That's going to take a while. And then you've got to wait for the court to make some decisions. That's going to take a while. It absolutely is. And all of it really is making me more stressed really and your family more stressed yeah the whole lot yeah, mm. yeah what's happening it could take years it could take it could take a year at least it could yeah that's exactly if right it's not um cut and dry so what happens with your funeral payment if there's if there's all this in-house stuff going on there's no will who pays for the funeral so the family wow who make oh well, so they'll have to pay out of their own pocket, not out of the estate, because you can't touch the estate, correct? So it's going to take longer before there's going to be any estate to pay them back. That's right. Mm. Wow, then that'll be a lot of stress, won't it? Because how much is the average funeral these days? Oh, Just for a small know. funeral, ten thousand. Ten thousand yeah. dollars. So mm. That's a lot of money to expect your family to be putting out if they haven't got um, access to that sort of funding as well. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Stressful times, where where it doesn't need to be that stressful. Mm. Mm. Yeah. What happens, Donna, if you um, if you haven't written a will, but you you know on your deathbed at some stage you've panicked and written some instructions down about where, where money should go? How would that? How does that stand up in in in, in law as far as a, you know you saying you want some you know these people having that and um, does that stand up? Mm. It does. It does stand up. It's going to cost you more money, though, than having a, a you know a proper will that's been properly witnessed. But you know, it may well be that what you've done on your deathbed is is do some important things. It might actually be a full will. So if, as long as you've appointed someone to administer your estate, yep. and you've said this is what I want to have to happen with my stuff, and you've had it witnessed by two people. You've signed it and you've had your signature witnessed by two people. Mm. People who are not beneficiaries and people who are not um, the executor. So they're not which, named in your will. Yeah, which could be quite hard when you're sort of surrounded by family and you can't sort of get out and get... Um, could it be yeah. a doctor? So, yes, it could be a doctor. 
Yes, mm. and a nurse. Yeah. So that's the best scenario, that you get everything signed and then you actually mm. do have a valid will. Mm. But if you have a will that, that doesn't actually do all of those things mm. but still expresses your wishes, mm. then it can be proved before the court and it can be considered to be a valid will. So there's, an, there's a piece of legislation called the Wills Act and one of the things it says is that a will that, that looks like a will and feels like a will but just doesn't fulfil all of the legal requirements of a will mm. can actually be proven to be a will. Wow. Well, that's handy to know. Yeah. So again, more expensive, mm. more stressful. Yeah. But yeah. Um, worth, worth knowing about. You're absolutely right. Yeah. And I guess not everyone is able to formally write it. I mean, and sometimes I guess, you know, if you ask people to write it for you, things can be written differently as well. Mm. Which, that's why you have that witness, I suppose, those two witnesses. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's one of the reasons that the law says two witnesses mm. to your will, yeah, yeah. to make sure it really was you. Mm. And you really said that. that. They actually watched you sign your will and, and believe that. It was correct. Yeah, that, that was you. <laughs> yeah, and again, that can bring up a whole lot of different other scenarios, especially if it was a doctor, depending on the situation, because someone could say, well, was they mentally cognitive? capable to make that decision. Yes, and you're bringing up one of the reasons, like sometimes wills are invalid, oh. and one of the reasons that a will might be invalid would be that you didn't actually have the mental capacity when you were writing it mm. to actually know what you were saying. You, know, you didn't really know what your assets were and you didn't know enough or you, or you couldn't remember enough to make it a valid will. Uh, so again, Costs more money, it's going to take a long time because it has to go through a, a legal process or it has to go through a process. Mm -mm. And I guess, you know, what you're talking about with a, with a deathbed will, there's a greater risk that someone could then say, you, re you weren't well enough. Yeah, you were coerced or... Yeah, yeah. that's right. Yeah. Or, or, that, or yeah, my sister was standing right over you mm. um, and you weren't well enough and you succumbed to the pressure she was putting on you. Mm. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess all the more reason to think about well, what's the best time to get a will now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and just sort it out. Yeah, just sort it out now while you know, you know, you're well, you know what you want, mm. and, um, and you don't leave it until the last minute. I was thinking about what you were talking about before and about how it's really important to, to think about who you want to receive your your assets. And one of the other things that people don't think about is who do you want to receive your pets? Oh. And so you might not have a child and you might not have $15,000 in the bank account, but you might have a very special pet or some very special pets. And um, you don't tend to think about it, but um, pets are considered to be assets under New Zealand law. And so you can give your pet to someone else or your pets to someone else in your will, and that might be something that you want to think about as well too. Yeah, Ken, because um, this is an American thing. Well, I don't know if it's an American thing, but I've heard it happen in America where, mm -hmm. you know, pets are given a million dollars as part of the, the will. So I've never heard of a million dollars. Yeah. But it's not abnormal for people who want to give a pet to someone, you know, that, that they know maybe doesn't have enough money to care for it as well as they want it to be cared for, yeah. to say, you know, I give you my pet and I also give you, I think probably the most I've come across is $20,000 to, to care for my pet the way that I have cared for it during my lifetime. Wow. And so that's... Yeah, it's not abnormal to give some money, but yeah. but not um, you know, huge amounts of money like in America. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, that it was crazy when I heard it, um, because I was thinking, what obligations does that person have after the they get the pet? Who checks up, you know, to make sure that that happens? Who has the enduring the power of attorney of the pet? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So the pet has no enduring power of attorney, <laughs> and it is trust. So one of the things about wills is that there are some things that you can say, this is what I give, and there are some things that you can say, it is my wish. Okay. And so quite a common thing in a will is that you, know, you give the pet, you give the money, 
to go with the for the care of the pet, but then you say, you know, it is my wish okay. that you care for my pet yep. in the way I have done, because you can't control from the grave. No, mm -hmm. yeah, no. you can't. No. You can't make that even with a will. You can't control from the grave. You can only express the wish. Mm. So if a person um, is to make a will, what is the process that they need to go through? How do they make a will? So you can make a will online. There are a range of ways of doing that. But, I mean, obviously I'd advise that it's a good idea to come and see a lawyer because sometimes you don't know what the, the pitfalls are until you've actually discussed with someone that knows what they're talking about, mm. what could go wrong or, or what might be a problem and, and what you should have in your will. And so obviously my advice would be to come and see a lawyer, talk with them and you make an appointment and say that it's co you're coming to see your will, um, coming to see someone to do with your will. Mm. And you can't ask questions of a um, if you do anything online either, can you? You can't sort of think, oh, I'd really like to find out about that. It's a lot of yeah, pushing buttons and making sure you're getting the right information. But when you can have a conversation with a lawyer, mm. um, it's right there mm. provided. Yeah, I'd always advise if someone has a blended family that they definitely see someone, see a lawyer about their will because that can be quite a complicated situation. And yeah, my preference always is, is if you if you're wanting to put in guardians for your children, that it's always a good idea to come and talk with someone about that as well too. Mm. And so, yeah, I, I'm going back to one of the questions that I feel like I didn't really ask, answer very well. You actually said, well, you know, what happens if you haven't got $15,000 in a bank? Let's just say you've got, you know, only $1,000 in the bank. Mm. Let's just say that you don't have any children. Let's just say you don't have any pets. Mm. And let's say that you are thinking, well, you know, there's no reason for me to have a will. Two things. One is, have you got KiwiSaver? Because people tend to not think about KiwiSaver and they tend to think, well, um, you know, that's, that's not going to be something I need to worry about. But actually, that's something that needs to be distributed with mm. a will. And... So two things, KiwiSaver, and what was the other thing? It's just gone out of my mind as I'm thinking now. Um, oh, the other thing is that just because you don't have money or a house or any sort of asset at the moment, you know, that's not to say that, that that's going to be the case for for the next five years mm. or the next 10 years. And so if you're thinking about a will now, even if you don't have assets and you don't have children, it's now's a good time to be actually going going ahead and, and making one. Because mm -hmm. you can always go and change it anyway. <laughs> you absolutely can. Mm. And that's probably something that people don't think of doing. They make a will, you know, when they're in their thirties maybe or starting to have children. Yes. And then they don't go back and review it because it, it you know, things can change, can't they? And you sort of forget about that. I think um, well, I was told that when I, when I got married, I should have gone in and changed my will at that at that time. Yeah, that's right. People and my, don't know about that. And my cousin said to me, because um, she's um, works for a lawyer, she said, "Have you, you know, have you changed your will since you got married? You know, like ten years ago?" And I said, "No, I thought it would just, you know, carry on." But she said, "You know, formally, you really need to go in and do those sorts of things. So there's lots of things that you need to be aware of when you do have a will." Yeah, that's right. Track. And we seem to tend to say to people, review your wills every five years and just double check and see whether your circumstances have changed. Mm -hmm. But getting married is a biggie. Mm -hmm. And often people don't realise. And so, you know, I have people who've come in to see me and said, oh, you know, we haven't updated our wills for 20 years. We really need to do it now because things have changed. And then it turns out that they together because you don't have to get married to a different person. You know, together when they were partners, de facto partners, they wrote wills 20 years ago. A year after they wrote the wills, they got married. From that point onwards, they haven't had a valid will. Oh. And so what people don't tend to think of is that it doesn't matter who you, that you get married to the same person that you might have written the wills with. You might have left that person mm. everything. But if you get married, that immediately invalidates those wills. Crazy, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Another question I have, um, Donna, is if I am a millionaire, don't have a will. Yeah. Okay. 
What happens if nothing, I don't have any children mm -hmm. or I have one child, but he's estranged, right? Okay. What happens to the estate if it's not unclaimed, you know, for say two years? Okay. Where does the money go to? Is mm -hmm. it, does it stay there for how long? Are they able to say in 10 years time, hey, that's my dad, blah, blah, and then what happens then? So you've got no parents? No. I just no, have a son. There's no spouse or partner? No. You've got one estranged son? One estranged son. Okay. And he's that 70 year old. He's a 70 year old? Yeah, yeah. All and right. Everyone else has died. Okay. And you haven't left a will? I haven't left a will. Okay. So that son is the logical person who will apply to be the administrator of your estate mm. because he's really the only person. And so he would apply to be administrator when he found mm. out about your death and under New Zealand law, he would then receive everything. Okay, so it doesn't matter when he applies, because like, say he's over in America, mm -hmm. okay, he's staying over there, then comes back 10 years later, finds out, because you know, we were estranged, that I've died. Who holds that money until? So it would just stay in the banks, or oh. stay in, um, it would just stay sitting there because you would still, there's no reason that the banks have to close your accounts. There's no reason that your shares or your um, anything has to happen. It might be a problem with your house if you happen to have a house yeah. ownership in your name. So, it, and it may be that if the son is, is not contactable, mm. at that point that someone else, someone completely different, maybe a niece or a nephew or someone who's further removed from you actually ends up having to apply to be the administrator of your estate, might be that the, that the Crown ends up holding those funds okay. um, until they can track down your son. Okay. Yeah, I wondered, but where does it go to? You know, as, as you said, yeah. the Crown takes control yeah. then. So eventually the Crown might take control. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's sort of a long way down the track, mm. but um, that would be after attempts to contact your son. Yeah, mm. yeah. That's it's something called bona facaccia. And bona facaccia? Where did yeah. that come from? <laughs> it's a Latin term. Okay. But um, that's when the crown is, is the person that's holding your estate yeah. until they can make a decision as to who the best person to distribute it is to. Mm. But let me give you another example. Okay. Um, let's just say that you, you have only a partner but you also have both of your parents are still alive and you have no will. Because this is another one of those situations where you would think, well, everything's going to go to my partner, of course. But it's another time when this piece of legislation, the Administration Act, kicks in and you get another unexpected result for, for some people. So your partner gets personal chattels again, gets the first $155,000, gets two thirds of everything that's left, and your parents actually get one third oh. of, of what remains. And so again, you, you might be surprised by that, and that might not be, be what you wanted mm. to have happen, mm. especially if you've got your millions. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. And she married you for your money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a complicated um, situation, as you said, yeah. if there's no instructions left. That's right. If there are no instructions left, yeah. um, and so you really, lose it's control. about looking forward. For me, anyway, looking forward and saying to myself, "How can I best help when I pass away to ease the burden on my family? What are things that I, I should do now? Because I don't know if tomorrow I'll wake. Oh, I'll open my eyes tomorrow, mm. but I know they're open now. Mm. Um, so, and one of the things I say to people when we do write wills is you've got to write this will assuming that something bad might happen to you next week mm. and so you you do it for next week mm. and and then as we were saying before you know you review your wills every every five years and so at that point you can have a look and say oh well it's still not my same wishes but but you know that you've made some decisions that will help the people in your life at the moment mm, cool uh, this question here's a little bit of a side step um Donna? Sure thing. Um, but uh, sometimes people get a little bit confused, and this is in terms of being uh, an attorney for EPA. Mm. 
when does that kick in um, in terms of where the executor takes over? Because sometimes I know of some instances where the attorney believes that they have the rights because they are the attorney. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's right. Sometimes people might say, well, on your death, not a problem because I'm the property attorney or mm. I'm the personal care and welfare attorney. Mm. And so, of course, I make all these decisions. But actually, on your death, your enduring power of attorney ceases immediately and your will kicks in if you've got one. Yep. So let's just say, though, that you've got a... You've got two enduring powers of attorney, you've got a personal care and welfare one, and you've got a property one. Mm -hmm. And so just in terms of when those documents kick in, the personal care and welfare one kicks in only if you lose mental capacity. And the property um, enduring power of attorney can kick in either immediately when, if you want it to, or only if you lose Cognitive capability. Yeah, that's right. Capacity. But the interesting thing, just to connect those enduring powers of attorney up to wills, mm. is that one of the things about the property enduring power of attorney is that you can choose in that document if you want to, and you can give the person the right to actually write a will for you if oh. you lose mental capacity. Wow. Wow. So... <laughs> Yeah, just, um, I mean, the, the documents tie in together. I, would, I wouldn't advise it. I'd advise that mm. if you're doing enduring powers of attorney that you sort out a will at the same time. Yeah. But um, those documents do tie in together that you've got to appoint someone that you trust enough um, as your personal care and welfare, uh, as your property attorney, that, yeah. you know, maybe they could write a will for you. Yeah, yeah. I'm pleased that you um, said that on your death, the EPA ceases to exist mm -hmm. and the executor takes control then. Exactly, yeah. yeah, that's right. And it works the other way too. Sometimes people say, well, I've already written a will and so therefore the executor of my estate's the person who can make these decisions while I'm still alive. I don't need enduring powers of attorney. Okay. But the documents don't cross over. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you might think that, and the, but actually no. You yeah, have to have those documents actually sorted. Yeah, the will is for after death and the enduring power of attorney is for if you lose um, the, the capacity to make decisions before your death. Okay. Yeah. Donna, time has flown. It's uh, 8.41. Okay. I know you have a meeting at 9. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming in and sharing your knowledge with us and enlightening us on what, what will help the family declutter their confusion, really, if we are prepared and leave instructions uh, for those who remain when we pass away. So, as you said, please get a will. And thank you very, very much for inviting me. And, yeah, I can't think of anything better than what you just said. Please get a will. Yeah, yeah. all right. Donna, thank you so much for your time. And we'll see you uh, next time, because we will have uh, further conversations uh, on 92.7 Arrow FM. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, and I'll see you later. Yeah, great day. <laughs> I think the good thing too is that um, you know, if, if if any of our listeners have any questions, you know, maybe that's something you know, if we get a lot of the yeah. same you know queries, we can invite Donna back and have a chat. Absolutely, um, absolutely, we can do that, Susie. People people want to talk about. Yeah, there's lots of you know to talk about as far as the law goes, and you know, all sorts of things, property ownership and everything. So this is my thoughts. If you have any questions, okay, go to our, our web page, okay, and you'll find a section where you can uh, contact us. Yep. Write those questions there, send them to us, and we'll develop another show with Donna coming in and answering your questions because mm. this is what you want to know, so let's give it to you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And this conversation might have just fired up some other information that you want to know about. So That's right. That's completely right. Um, but first... I want to thank uh, Ginny and Alison um, from Age Concern. A Alison was the project manager. Last Friday we had a Aging with Attitude Expo, <laughs> and it was fantastic. So I'd like to thank those two ladies uh, for making it happen, and also our storeholders. We had about 60 storeholders, I think. There was a lot of them. Thank you for supporting us, and also for the community. Um, I, th I thought there was I only said there was 400 because that's the amount of bags uh, we had and we gave them all out. There may have been more people, but thank you to the public um, to coming in and supporting our Aging with Expo um, 
event that was awesome. What was your thoughts about the expo, Susie? Well, <clears throat> I think I was on a high all day and I'm, I think I suffered all weekend recouping from that um, because, um, you know, working on the door and um, our store was right there. It was We were seeing a lot of people, welcoming a lot of people, which was fantastic. Everyone seemed to have smiles on their faces. We had great entertainment from uh, Masterton Intermediate as well and Stefan uh, sort of crooned away in the background, which was fabulous, just creating that little bit of atmosphere and entertainment. Um, it was a great day. Uh, it seemed to go off extremely well. I don't think we had anything major happening. Mm -hmm. And if it did, um, it obviously was handled straight away. Um, yeah, it was good to see. We even some, uh, when I was out in the foyer at one stage, there were some visitors to the Wairarapa um, hearing some music coming and, and wanted to come in and have a look as well. So a lot of people. The feedback that I've heard has been, you know, amazingly fantastic and uh, yes, we'll um, hopefully be able to evaluate everything and make it even um, better next time if we can do that. <laughs> yeah, an extravaganza next time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and as you said, Susie, and rightly so, big ups to uh, Russell Thompson and the mm. MIS Kapaka and Poly Fest group. To Mickey, Karawea to Karawea. Yeah, yeah we had awesome. yeah a couple of them on the door, which they swapped over every so often, handing out information to our <clears throat> people coming in, and they were. I was listening to them, and they were informative. They were really sharp about what they were saying, and um, a great representation of the young people in our community. Mm -hmm. If this is what is coming through at an intermediate level, you know we're we're doing so well with our young people. Yeah, and they did an awesome job in the kitchen too. Yeah, in the cafeteria, and as Susan said they were very polite, mm. respectful, and wanting to help um, the yeah. Korean Kurawa that we were coming through. Perfect. Awesome. So big ups to uh, MIS. And also, Stefan, the music bro was really, really good. So if you can hear me out there in the ether, you know, big ups for you. That was great. And thank you so much, uh, you and your troubadours, but also you and your group. Um, we really enjoyed the sound that was coming out. It was mm really nice to hear so we look forward to our next one i don't know when that will be but <laughs> <laughs> whether we'll do biannually or annually i'm not sure um but i know that it was helpful for kui and kuroa to know what's out there in the community to support them in their old age mm. uh, that was really good and i'm looking forward to maybe next time having a, a midi midi uh chair there uh, so that you can even Ooh. book in. And, yeah, I had a conversation with one of the storeholders and said, well, you do this, why not? Um, be able to give them a midi midi um, mm. as part of their experience. Yeah. Again, so that people know what's out there um, for, for help. And it's not only for older people. No. No. It's for younger people. And when I'm talking about younger, I'm talking about 50-year-old people because – you're moving into that category. Yeah, we're all ageing and yeah. um, it's good um, even in your 40s, I think, to find out what's in our community. Yeah. Um, and and those people that have got older parents, um, it's good to find out what's available. So I think there are a, a huge range of, of people that were coming along because there were people that were making inquiries about their aged um, families and what you know what's out there in the community. Mm. Yeah, so yeah, I thought it was absolutely fantastic. Yep, so um, for us in ageing care, okay, it's all about attitude. When we're 65, you remember that song? Will you still need me? Will you still feed me? When I'm 64. <laughs> 64. <laughs> uh, the answer is yes. The answer is yes, because we still have a lot of value to offer um, the community. Sometimes through ageism, we think, oh, no, that's retiring. You just go to the side. No, that's just the start mm. or on, of a, an adventure in terms of um, going out and being a part of whatever is in the community, mm. sharing. And even if you have to go out, I, I was down in uh, Motueka, Nelson, last on the weekend. And then amount of older people biking is crazy. The amount of older people walking the tracks because they've got a lot of tracks in Nelson mm. was really great to see because we know with mobility, strength and mobility, 
you know, you go out and do these exercises, it reduces the risk of falls. Absolutely. And I think it's important to be out socialising and, you know, trying to stay in your home for as long as possible um, because it's nice to be around uh, familiar spaces and keeping fit and getting out and socialising um, gives you um, sort of like a renewed life, I guess. Um, knowing that you can, even if you're on your own, uh, joining up with something like Rachel's um, Buddy Up and finding those other small communities um, or people of interest, uh, you can you know, build relationships with people that you can go out to mm -hmm. do different social things, um, music, um, events and all those things things that you know sometimes you don't want to go on your own which I sort of found with our wider upper college uh, centenary it's hard to get your <laughs> get your body going get motivated when you know you're sort of going to be there on your own but if you've got someone to go with yeah and um, meeting up with groups through um age age concern is a great um value for that speaking about that Susie, would you like to just um give us a shout out of the activities that are happening for age concern what days they are yeah, so um, you know, talking about exercises um, and keeping involved with that, we've got Steady As You Go in Featherston on Mondays at 9.30 at the Assembly of God, uh, which is in Birdwood Street. There's also Steady As You Go in Masterton on Monday at 1.30 and Thursday at 9.30 at the Senior Citizens Hall in Cole Street. Um, both of those, um, oh, and also there's a Keep Fit in Masterton at 9.30 and 10.30, 9.30 on a Monday and 10.30 on a Thursday at the Senior Citizens Hall. So uh, those classes are $2 per class and we're doing one in Carterton, which is fab, on a Wednesday at 1.30 at the Baptist Church. So yeah, get out and, and try and keep fit. Um, fit body, fit mind, all those sorts of That's things right. that keeps you out. Um, endorphins going, so you, yeah, it helps. Yeah, and we yeah. do do line dancing, which is really exciting if you've got a bit of coordination. And if you haven't, it's a good challenge for your brain yeah. um, on a Monday at 10.30 at the Senior Citizens Hall. What about coffee mornings? Coffee mornings, we have Martinborough, Featherston, Carterton and Masterton. Martinborough is the first Wednesday the, of the month at St. Andrew's Anglican Church in Dublin Street. Masterton is Tuesday fortnightly beginning on the 14th of March. So that's a change of venue which is really exciting at the Pigeon and Poultry and that starts at 10 o'clock. So that's going to be fortnightly with lots of um, cool stuff happening there. Uh, I think if you were lucky enough to come to the first one last week you would have found that it was really exciting and uh, yeah lots of activities. Uh, Featherston second Wednesday of the month at the Featherston Community Centre and Carterton third Wednesday of the month at the Baptist Church. Uh, they're all uh, 10 o'clock at Carterton, 10.30 Featherston, 10 o'clock at Martinborough. Uh, this slot has gone really fast Susie. Yeah which is great. It is It is good and so uh, just to recap um, well, if you haven't got one, consider about getting one because it's just going to help your family in the future when you're not here and um, to be able to make some decisions about your estate and how you might have want things to happen after you pass away. Don't make it so that our, our whanau is more stressed after we, we die. It is a stressful time as it is. So let's consider them as we move to the next realm so that um, they can be supported by us even from the grave. So people, thank you so much for uh, joining us today on Aging with Attitude 92.7 Arrow FM. Um, as I said, my name's Anthony and... And Susan. And we'll see you in a month's time. If you want us to have more shows, write the comment down. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. We like to hear from people. We like to hear from people. Get us know, and if you want things to, uh, topics that you want us to talk about, drop us a line because at the end of the day this is your show and we're being led by you other than that have a great day have a great week have a great month have a great life matewa e